Well, hello, everyone. I'm Charles Alcock with AIN. Now, you know, as we know, in the wake of this uh, dreadful COVID-19 pandemic, aviation has certainly taken a big hit. And unfortunately, business aviation hasn't been immune from that. Um, there, there's a lot of uh, difficulty and, and challenges being faced by the industry. And of course, this has got people talking about, well, what can government do to try and alleviate this situation? Now, watching what's happening in the US, we're joined by my AIN colleague, senior editor Kerry Lynch, who is pretty close to Washington, D.C., and she's watching closely what's happening there. Uh, Kerry, last week um, we saw the passing of this this pretty monumental piece of legislation, the uh, Coronavirus Aid and Relief and Economic Security Act. Um, In simple terms, what can we say this might mean for business aviation? What does it amount to, really? Well, Charlie, there it, it is a help to business aviation. How much and who it helps are the details that's all being sorted out right now. Directly for aviation businesses, Congress set aside eighty, roughly about eighty billion dollars mm. directly. But there are several other pots of money that business aviation may want to pay attention to that are in the terms of small business loans and grants, mm. but. As far as the 80 billion, most of that was designed for the airlines, so much so that the guidance that came out was really tailored towards large commercial entities and airlines. And organizations such as NATA and MBAA have gone back and asked for guidance that could better apply to their members. Yeah. Now, what what that 80 billion does is it breaks down roughly half, and it's not exact is for in grants that is designated directly to employee assistance, salaries, benefits, Mm -hmm. and any other things associated with employee compensation. Those do not have to be paid back unless it gets used for something else. But there's so many stipulations, and most of them will apply to larger entities, like no dividend payouts, no um, stock buybacks, But there is one provision that's been used in relief packages in the past that will allow the government at their discretion to buy to get a stake in your company if you choose to go this route. Now, whether they will or not, nobody knows. And I'm not even sure the Treasury Department knows. But there's 25 billion directly in grants for passenger carriers. This also includes 135. However, 25 billion, while it sounds like a big pot, yeah. I, I sat through a National Air Transportation Association webinar and they laid out all the different commercial carriers and how much they could qualify for, and it exactly equals 25 billion. So therefore, it's going to be a small slice of the pie for part 135 or so it appears. And their recommendations are get your applications in ASAP. And when I say ASAP, it could be by the end of today, the end of this week. Wow. And uh, and if it's if you get it in past the end of April, they won't even consider it. So sooner immediately get it in. And um, even if there are provisions in there that you won't like, that you don't want to live by, they still say apply and because you'll get an agreement back from the government and see what those provisions are. Now, there are other pots of money, too, that are go to loans for cargo carriers and for contractors. And contractor could be an FBO that provides um, fuel handling for the airlines. Uh, now, for the loans, again, there's one for passenger carriers, also talking about uh, air charter companies, but also Part 145 maintenance outfits. And um, the loans, I'm not as clear on as far as what the stipulations are, but just read the fine details. People are still figuring that part out. Mm-hmm. There were other p- bits of relief in the act, including a hun- hundred billion, or I'm sorry, a hundred mm-hmm. million yeah. set aside for general aviation airports, which was good news and something that was pushed by the entire general aviation community and the states. Mm-hmm. Um, there also is a tax relief provision that suspends 
the commercial ticket tax. So if you're a charter and you assess the, and charter only, and you assess the 7.5% ticket tax, you don't have to um, assess it now through the end of the year, nor do you have to, well, let me clarify this. Yeah, nor please do. do you have to pay the, um, fuel tax, that 4.3, 4.4 cent per gallon fuel tax that the carriers pay. But I have to clarify that because most charter companies have to pay for it up front and they get rebated. So they have to pay both the ticket tax and the fuel tax on general aviation and then get a rebate mm-hmm. on the fuel tax on genera- general aviation. But now you'll also be getting the rebate, I assume, for the 4.4 cent per gallon. And they discussed this at the webinar yesterday, and they're still trying to figure out what that mechanism will be as far as how you get that money back. Yeah, um, yeah. So what I'm hearing in the big picture is, you know, really good news in that the federal government is loosening the purse strings and it's come up with this huge sack of money. Um, but there's all manner of headache inducing complexity to this. But the message seems to be don't even worry about that complexity for now. The first thing everybody in this industry needs to do is get their application in, get a stake in the ground and and kind of fret over the details later, because otherwise you'll be on the sidelines uh, p- possibly missing out. Well, certainly for the, the businesses where this applies, you know, the MROs, the FBOs that handle um, airline fuel and charter companies. Now, there, uh, Charlie, you and I know there are many, many other businesses. There's mm-hmm. management companies. There's ch- charitable organizations. There's, um, you know, corporate flight departments. There's this the small business owner flyer. There's, mm-hmm. you know, the fuel, the many, many other FBOs. There's many, many businesses that this isn't applying to. They can look at the small business loans mm-hmm. and try their their hand there. I will say the associations aren't giving up on assistance. They have, they're working with lawmakers yeah. and they're working with government to try and get as much latitude as possible. But I, I guess the message is, is look at every pre- provision of that CARES Act. If you are a U.S. company, mm-hmm. look at every provision of that CARES Act and see where you can get pots of money and apply everywhere and do it right away. Yeah, very good point. And, you know, from what you're hearing, do you think this this offer of help, whether it's through loans or whatever else it might be, might have an influence on individual businesses right now who are, who are staring this dreadful situation in the face and thinking, well, gee, you know, how many people do I need to lay off? Do I, you know, what other cost cutting do I need to do? Do you think it might be enough to make them think, okay, I can keep somewhat calm here. There is some help available. Uh, I just need to get by on my own resources until I can get some of this money flowing my way. Do you think it will have an impact, I guess, is what I'm saying? Charlie, you know, that's a really good question. And I think it's um, dependent on the businesses. One Mm -hmm. thing that I didn't specify that I should mention Mm -hmm. is in um, the stipulation with getting the employee assistance, you cannot lay off your employees through September 30th. And then Mm -hmm. after that, you're limited on how many um, you can lay off. So there's... If, if you're in a position where you can keep them on salary, this is going to greatly relieve you if you get the assistance you need. Mm-hmm. Um, you cannot file for bankruptcy, though. So if mm-hmm. you're in that point where you're facing bankruptcy, this is, isn't going to help you. Now, there may be other loans and pots of money that get you through that might be game changers. But it really depends on how cash positive your business is. Mm-hmm. And, the, you know, it's a help. And there there again, the need to do things quickly. In other words, don't sit on your hands for several weeks worrying about whether you're going bankrupt. You know, get these applications in. Exactly. Yeah, good. Okay, well, that's going to require some following. And, um, you know, that it all sounds very complicated, but it does sound like the the trade associations are on the case and paying attention to it. Um, And you mentioned that you'd you'd been talking to NATA on a webinar. I guess maybe they also talked about what the Federal Aviation Administration might be doing. I mean, there are so many um, headaches out there, like, you know, how do you keep your your uh, your flight crew rated? How do you handle things like um, pilot medicals and so on. Has has there been much discussion of what practical things the FAA might be doing? 
Yes. As a matter of fact, the FAA is kind of in an untenable situation because they're being barraged and they have been for weeks now Mm -hmm. for requests for relief from all aspects of aviation because everything is regulated. Everything has a deadline. You know, there's always recurrent trainings and renewal of medicals and, you know, different types of the ability to go to match up with a Czech airman. There's so many different things that you don't even think about if you don't, until you don't have the ability or access to those services. So the FAA has been working fast and furiously trying to get through all these requirements and give appropriate relief. The, um, for part 135, and this includes the 119, the, the commercial carriers as mm-hmm. well that are also under 135, they have issued relief from some training requirements and extending deadlines. And interestingly, one of the reliefs was a requirement that crew members must don protective breathing equipment or oxygen <laughs> masks. And that's yeah. that's a health issue. So yeah. that's and then they gave three months extension to recurrent training and qualification requirements that may come due before May 31st. Um, another big area is in medicals, and that applies to all airmen, whether you're in Part 135 or um, you're just a general aviation pilot. But um, there's been a little bit of confusion on that, Charlie, and mm-hmm. um, because the FAA took an unusual step by putting out a legal opinion rather than an exemption that says we will not enforce it if your medical expires before June 30th. Now, um, there have been some associations who've been a little concerned because it's not an extension. You will still have an expired medical. So legally, you won't be legal. But, um, you know, FAA is just saying, that's okay. We're going to turn the other way. And yeah, um, yeah. that puts up a, few, a little bit of concern about whether insurance carriers will honor that if you have an expired medical. Yes, so yes. The advice is, is if you can at all possible renew, then go ahead right. and do it. But the FAA is recognizing it's not good to have everybody rush to their medical provider to to get the necessary physicals and sign off so they can get this renewed. So they understand that. So they're going to say, we're not going to enforce it. I did reach out to um, an insurance provider to see what their stance on this. And um, the response came back that they're going to honor FAA and they believe that Mm. that's what other insurance carriers intend to do. The advice is just talk to your insurance carrier if you are in that category. And also, when they spoke on that webinar yesterday, they said, keep a paper trail. So if you're going to let it lapse, then keep a paper trail saying, you know, that you are not that you are letting this lapse. And you know that all your right. if you're an operator, this is who's lapsing and, and you are being responsible for their health and their so you're not having somebody with a medical condition who shouldn't be fly fly just mm-hmm. because the, the FAA is looking the other way. You're still responsible for the safety and security of your operation. So keep as many detailed notes as you can. Now, the FAA did do a limited exemption mm-hmm. for Part 135 international operations. Why there's an ex- exemption in this part and what the exemption does is actually extend your medical. So now you're, even if it was supposed to expire, say at the end of April, it's good through the end of June now. And the reason why they did that is because foreign governments won't necessarily accept expired medicals that FAA says, oh, we're just looking the other way on. Right, right, right. For- and so that opens all sorts of it. Yeah, it's really tricky, isn't it? Because if you're a company, okay, you're glad that you're being cut some slack. But as you say, there are limits to that slack and there are possible knock-on consequences if you don't you know, keep a proper paper trail and make sure you've taken account of considerations like insurance. But in fairness, FAA, I guess it's kind of tough because if they're looking at this and thinking, well, we might be in this situation for 
two or three months, we can afford to, you know, be a little bit relaxed over some aspects of enforcement. But it's a different thing if this goes on for, God forbid, you know, six months or longer, because then they're thinking, well, in the interest of safety, we can't just have pilots who haven't had medicals. We can't just have pilots who haven't had recurrent training. You know, I guess I'm saying there have to be limits to this flexibility. I, you know, and it's a good point, And I would imagine that's true. Mm-hmm. Now, um, I will say John McGraw, who used to be a senior FAA official who now does work with NATA, did say it would be an easy process for them to extend some of these exemptions mm-hmm. and deferrals. But you're right. There will be an absolute limit because there is a safety. Um, there is a safety implication to not having, you know, you know, recurrent training. Right. Now there, you know, I did a story on CAE oh, about a week ago about what they're doing and there still is training going by, but mm-hmm. you need to be able to get people to where they need to be. You need to have the right mm-hmm. authorities to, and um, delegates to be able to sign off on it. And these are just two areas. I mean, there's a whole host of areas that FAA is working on. Um, apparently, they put out guidance regarding um, video, use use of video and in inspections. So mm. maintainers can properly do their work and show the FAA that they're meeting standards. You know, all the whole designee program, you know, there's FAA's working on guidance there. So th- there are many other aspects. This is a very complex issue. Yeah, good point. Yeah. And I guess overlapping all of that, I mean, we talk about business aviation as if it sort of happens in complete isolation from the rest of normal life. You know, in many of the US states and certainly uh, here in Europe in many states, you know, you've got essentially national stay at home rules, lockdowns, as some countries call them. So it doesn't matter if you work in business aviation or or in a bowling alley, you know, you're you're not necessarily allowed to to freely go about your normal business. No. And uh, Charlie, I live in the state of Virginia and we have a stay at home order through June 10th, right. which is one of the longer ones in the United States. But yeah. Yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And, and that brings up the other issue that some pilots may not want to fly. Mm. And so mm. uh, NATA and I'm sure the other associations. Oh. And by the way, all the associations have resource pages. MBAA does. And MBA has a great page that outlines all the provisions in the CARES Act. So go visit their websites. NATA does. Go visit their websites and, you know, dig into some of the details. Yes, that's a good point. I've seen some of that and it is very helpful indeed. Well, that's interesting. You're, C- Kerry, I don't think your work's ever going to be done here. You're going to be uh, spending possibly most of the rest of this year following this, this situation. But in general, from the interactions you've had with people in the industry, you know, looking at what I think are pretty unprecedented situations like uh, business aircraft factories being uh, shut down temporarily and operations being disrupted. I mean, how do you feel the industry is sort of taking this? Do they, I don't want to put words in their mouth, but do do they look at this and think, well, that's it, 2020 is kind of a write-off? Or do they think, well, no, it's just a matter of weeks. If we could just get back in the swing of things, we'd be okay. I mean, how, how do you think the industry is doing, roughly speaking? Well, Charlie, um, not to to pass off on this, but I think the answer to your question is yes and yes. Mm -hmm. I think some people, it's going to be a complete, with some people, organizations, this is going to be a complete write-off and others are going to be able to weather the storm. You know, I was just on an Embraer call a few weeks. uh, I guess it was last week I was on the Embraer call. And it was interesting because they were still making deliveries and even booking orders. They booked two orders last week. Mm -hmm. So um, there is commerce that is happening. Uh, Bombardier, which is cash starved, it doesn't help them that they have shut down their uh, factory for a month or so. And they're doing this in, in honor of the, the local government and the national government's uh, policies. But they need to get those, you know, global 7500s and their high at global global 65, 5500s, their high-end products out in cash in their um, pockets. And this is not going to help their ramp-up efforts at all. Yeah. Different companies are all taking different um, stances. Textron was one of the first to um, 
they didn't shut down, but they did staged furloughs. And um, they did that, I think, through the end of May. Mm -hmm. So um, everybody's taking a different approach. Embraer is uh, took a very novel approach because they sent their employees home with pay. Very, I haven't seen that anywhere else. But they've they've recalled a limited, like maybe. 10% 10% of their employees, and this is just in Brazil because they have to honor whatever's going on in the country that mm-hmm. they're operating in um, to get production up and going, but they restage their production area so they can have separation and they can continue to do that and some support and some maintenance functions. Yeah. Well, part I guess part of it, not to labor this point, but part of it is before this emergency blew up in our faces, I mean, the industry was generally facing kind of a skills shortage. In other words, they didn't have enough people. So I guess what some of these companies are mindful of is, yes, we've got to get those payroll costs under control. But equally, when things are returning to normal, they've got to make sure those skills are still there available to them. They can't just sweep those people away and, and, and assume they're still going to be there for them. Exactly. And, and that, it, that's a great point, Charlie, because that's going to, that would become what was a growing problem an acute problem if this labor pool disappears. Yeah. Wow. What do they say? Enough of the problems of today, I suppose. We, one day at a time should be our mantra. Well, that's really fascinating. Um, you know, clearly we haven't resolved everything um, for just about everybody in this industry. This is, I think it's fair to say, just about completely unprecedented. There have been other emergencies, but not quite of this nature. So please, if we can, Kerry, let's let's keep in touch. Let's try and catch up again in a week or so and see how things are holding up. And uh, you please stay safe there under lock and key or however else are enforcing the, the arrangements there in Virginia. Well, thank you, Charlie. And of course, you. I hope you stay safe there in the UK. Will do. And- Brilliant. Good to talk with you, Kerry. Thanks for watching this AIN video. Please like, subscribe, and share it if you've enjoyed it. Also, visit AINonline.com for all the latest on the aviation industry.